Hi everyone, this video is part three of the 2B series on memory and the cognition content for AP Psychology students. This particular video will focus on memory storage. So as you can see here on the unit outline, this video is the third in a set of five on memory. This particular video is focusing on how information is kept and retained in the mind over different spans of time. Throughout this video, I will focus on a few major themes, and by the end of the video, you should be able to answer these three key focus questions. These are the vocabulary concepts that you should take note of while listening to the video. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So as you learned in the previous video, the information processing model of memory uses the terms encoding, storing, and retrieving. And to explain the way that the brain operates, the information uh, processing model for memory helps us to understand how information gets in, stays, and then is taken back out later. And so in this particular video, I will focus in depth on the step called storage. And it's important that you know that the mind has different capacities for storage and different durations. So in this video, I'll break down each of those different realms of storage as well as the different types of memory that fits into each of those categories. There are three capacities of memory, which you've already learned about. This is what the multi-storage model is explaining, that there is first sensory memory. And sensory memory is where information is moving into and held the shortest. Sensory memory is sometimes referred to as the sensory register, and it has the smallest and shortest capacity. Information comes in from the outside world, and then it stays for just a few seconds, and then is immediately replaced with the constant flow of new information that's coming into your senses. Sensory memory can be further broken down into iconic memory and echoic memory. These are the storage systems within your sensory memory that hold the incoming visual and auditory information. Iconic memory is the sensory storage for visual information. And I remember this because when I think of icon, I think of that small graphic symbol that you see on your phone or computer screen. And this is a small image that you click on to take you to a web page or a particular program. And this icon is a visual image. And so that helps me remember iconic memory is the storage for visual information that enters your mind through your eyes. And then a echoic memory is the storage for um, holding that auditory information that goes in through your ears that's only held briefly and then immediately replaced with new information that enters your ears. Information that is in your sensory memory that is paid attention to can transfer into your short-term memory. And this really only stays as long as you are actively thinking about it. The capacity is limited. Unlike our long-term memory that can house numerous amounts of information for days, weeks, and years, our short-term memory is much smaller and much shorter. Let me give you an example to help you understand the capacity of your short-term memory. I will read you a series of numbers. Each series will be different. And after I read one set, I want you to hold it in your mind until I say the word write, and then I want you to take out a pencil and paper and write down the items that you were holding in your mind onto your paper. And in order to really understand short-term memory, I don't want you to employ any types of memory tricks. So no mnemonic devices, no strategies, just try to hold them in your mind as they are. And I will do this for nine sets. I will call them by letters. So I'll call it set A and then set B. And then as I go through them, you will write them down onto your paper. Okay, so remember to hold the items from each set in your mind until I say the word right. All right, the first set is set A. Ready? Three, six, four, two. Right. I'll continue to go at this pace and make sure to pause the video if you need time to write down your answer. Set B, eight, zero, one, nine, five, right. Set C, four, two, seven, one, three, six, right. Set D, Seven, one, four, nine, zero, 
two, five, right. Set E, five, three, zero, one, eight, six, nine, four, right. Set F, one, five, nine, six, three, two, nine, one, seven, right. Set G, six, two, zero, five, one, four, eight, two, nine, three, right. And finally, set H, four, seven, two, nine, one, three, eight, one, five, four, nine, right. Okay, how did that go? Well, let's check your answers. So set A had four items and each set following added one additional item. I imagine you were able to easily remember set A and probably set B. As each set added an additional item, it should have gotten more and more challenging. And as long as you just held those numbers in your mind without trying to create a mnemonic device or trying to pair or chunk them down, it likely began to get very challenging, especially towards the end. And the reason for this is because your short-term memory has a capacity of about seven bits of information at a time. Psychologist George A. Miller published a study in 1956 that he called the magical number seven plus or minus two. And George Miller found that short-term memory can only hold about seven items, give or take two at a time. These items can be numbers, letters, words, or other bits of information. So in my example, set F had nine items. And according to Miller's magic number seven plus or minus two, it should have been nearly impossible to hold all of those items all the way in set G and in H in your mind without having to chunk them down. It just would have been really, really challenging because it surpassed that seven plus or minus two. Now chunking, according to Miller, can allow you to hold more information by pairing those items into groups so that you remember groups instead of separate individual items. And further research confirms that if nothing is distracting us, we can recall about seven bits of information, but that number varies depending on the task. So for example, later studies on short-term memory capacity have shown that for letters, the number is closer to six. And for words, it's closer to about five. Working memory capacity also varies by age. Young adults tend to have a better working memory capacity than children and older adults. So how quickly do our short-term memories disappear? To find out, Lloyd Peterson and Margaret Peterson asked people to remember three consonant groups, such as C, H, J. Now, to prevent them from rehearsing those items over and over in their mind, the researchers distracted the participants by asking them to start at 100 and begin counting aloud backwards by three. After about three seconds, the participants recalled the letters only about half the time. After 12 seconds, they seldom recalled the letters that were given to them at all. So you can see this memory decay on the chart on the screen that's labeled figure 2.4-2 without the active processing that we now understand to be a part of our working memory, short-term memories are very, very limited and do not last very long at all. Now to hold information longer in our minds, we can rehearse it or repeat it. Maintenance rehearsal and elaborative rehearsal are two different types of strategies we can use to try to keep information longer in our memory. Maintenance rehearsal is the process of repeatedly verbalizing or repeatedly thinking about information to keep it in our short-term memory. Maintenance rehearsal would be like saying something over and over and over again, like repeating a phone number over and over and over again until you dial it. However, this method is usually not very effective in getting that information into your long-term retention because it doesn't really involve any kind of deeper processing and it mainly helps just extending the duration of your short-term memory. Maintenance rehearsal focuses on keeping information active in your memory, but it's not going to transfer it into long-term memory. You might remember this term from a previous video being shallow processing and that's what maintenance rehearsal is. It's a shallow processing method. Elaborative rehearsal is a process that 
involves linking that new information to existing knowledge by creating meaningful connections. So instead of just repeating it over and over and over to try to keep it in your short term memory longer, elaborative rehearsal requires you to think about the meaning of the information and then relate it to concepts you already know or create associations to it. Both of these processes are occurring within your working memory that you're actively processing that information and both of them are involving you attending to that information. Um, however, elaborative rehearsal is going to be more likely to take it out of working memory and move it into long term memory. Now, our long term memories are those that are kept and then can be called upon later at another time hours, days, weeks, or even years later, long-term memories are not stored like videos that can be played back later or in a book placed on a shelf that can be reread at another time. This information is kept either knowingly or unknowingly and housed in different places in the brain. As you know, the hippocampus plays a really key role in long-term memory storage, but memories are also stored in other places like our cerebellum and our basal ganglia. These memories may also be difficult to retain retrieve and may only come back when tri triggered by certain cues. Pieces of information may also be tied to familiar places or smells or tastes. So for the remainder of the video, I'll share about the different types of information we store in our long-term memory. When you were to ask someone to share about a memory they have, they're likely going to share an explicit memory. This is referring to the information you are consciously aware of in your memory and you're consciously drawing it out. These are are the memories you have for facts and knowledge and experiences. You're aware of this information in your mind. You're conscious that you're retrieving that information out of your mind. These are explicit memories and they're stored in your hippocampus. So when you try to summon up stored explicit memories, you are going to pull out that information from your hippocampus and it will be brought into your working memory to process. And this is going to be processed in your prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for processing your working memory. Now, depending on what what type of information you are pulling out of your long-term memory, it may go into your right or your left prefrontal cortex. For example, if you are recalling visual memories, it's probably going to go into your right side of your prefrontal cortex. Whereas if you're recalling a password and you're pulling that out of your long-term memory, it's probably going to be brought into your working memory to be processed on the left side of your prefrontal cortex. Now, there are two main types of explicit memories. There's episodic memories and semantic memories. Episodic memories refer to the long-term information you store related to experienced events, things like your first day of school, a vacation with your family, or a trip you took with your friends. Semantic memories refer to the long-term information you store related to knowledge and facts, like who is the president of the United States? What is the equation you use to find the slope of a triangle? Or how many continents are there? We can store information more readily in explicit memory if it fits with our existing schemas or frameworks that we already have. It's more challenging to try to retain new information if it doesn't connect with information we already have in our mind or match schemas that we already have. So a memory tip for you is when you're trying to study or retain explicit memories or retain information, it's going to be more likely to be kept if you can try to connect it to things you already know. Autobiographical memories are a subset of episodic memories. As you know, episodic memories are recollections of events about one's past. Um, think of it like recalling an episode of your life. Episodic memories are a more broad concept where autobiographical memory is a more narrow memory about the self. It's referring to very specific facts about yourself, like when and where were you born. Now, as you can see in the blue box at the bottom of the screen, the CED wants you to have a better understanding of, of highly superior autobiographical memories. And that just means that some people have better autobiographical memories than others. For example, Jill Pierce is the first documented case of having a highly superior autobiographical memory or HSAM. And this was studied extensively in 2006 and 2014. She can recall nearly every detail of her life since the age of 14 effortlessly remembering events and dates, even the weather of specific days. 
However, her exceptional memory is actually just limited to autobiographical details, and she doesn't necessarily outperform others in, in other types of recall type of tasks, but rather specifically these autobiographical events. As you might recall from the first video on encoding, some information actually slips into our long-term memory storage without us even really being aware that it's being encoded. We call this automatic processing. And once that information is retained and stored, we call that information implicit memory or memories that we're just not consciously aware that we have. And we often draw upon them without even realizing it. You don't need to consciously think about or recall these memories. They are just brought upon when you need them. Um, these would be things like knowing how to ride a bike or possibly feeling anxious when you hear a loud siren. Um, these are memories that seeped in without you realizing it and then are drawn out without you having to consciously process them. Implicit memory includes includes a really broad range of things like learned skills, habits, and conditioned responses that occur outside of our conscious awareness. So implicit memories are actually stored in your cerebellum and your basal ganglia. Now a procedural memory is a specific type of implicit memory that focuses on motor skills and actions and how to do things. It's a memory of how to perform tasks that require motor coordination or physical movements. So think about when you get ready to brush your teeth, you know all of those steps from placing the toothpaste onto the toothbrush and brushing your teeth and remembering not to swallow. Knowing all of those steps would be a procedural memory. So would things like remembering how to tie your shoes or play a musical instrument, drive a car, and any skill that's just been ingrained in your memory to perform automatically, often without even thinking about it. So procedural memory are involving this how-to knowledge to perform a physical task and carrying out all of those sequences of movements that you have developed through repeated practice. Now, the last type of long-term memory is called prospective memory. And this is a type of long-term memory about future events. It's referring to the ability to remember and carry out a planned action. So prospective memory involves holding on to a plan at the right time, remembering and carrying out that action. So this would be like remembering to feed the cat before leaving the house or remembering to attend a meeting at a certain time or remembering to send a friend a card on their birthday. These are prospective memories. So here's a broader look at the hierarchy that we have developed through working throughout this video. You can see in this visual, the sequencing of the different types of memory and the ordering of them based on where you can categorize them. Now, before I close out the video though, I wanna share four important takeaways with you. The first is that sensory memory is the shortest and smallest. The second is that short-term memory can only hold about seven bits of information and working memory refers to how we need to actively process that information to hold it in short-term memory. Third is long-term memory. And long-term memory is our longest storage section or storage station, and this has unlimited capacity and duration. And then finally, memories are not in one single place in the brain, but they can be stored in different places depending on the type of memory. And then when they're called upon, they can be brought forward into the prefrontal cortex to be worked on and processed in working memory. So let's finish today's video with a few short questions for review. I'll read the questions out loud, so you'll need to pause whenever you want to determine the answers. Question number one says, Maloney's boss gave her the phone number, including the area code of a client she needed to call. As Maloney goes to enter the number into her contacts list on her phone, she finds that she cannot remember all of the numbers in the right order. Which of the following is the best explanation for this fail failure? Question number two says, Dr. Gunda conducted a memory experiment that examined the brain regions associated with forming implicit memories. Which of the following would be the best choice for his independent variable? Question number three says, after reading about the results of a study on memory, imagine that you read this statement. After observing hundreds of participants across their lives, researchers found that this type of memory is nearly limitless and lasts at times for a lifetime. Which variable is most likely being discussed in this description? This concludes today's video lesson on memory storage. Listed on the left-hand side of the screen are the answers to the review questions, and on the right are the questions and concepts. Before finishing up, make sure to take a moment to check your understanding of the essential concepts from today's video.